Hey everybody, it's Lavender Town, and I hope you're somewhere cozy and safe because today I'm going to be doing a reading of Pen Pal by 1000 Vultures. This story is so long that I'm actually only doing the first two parts, so if you'd like to hear the rest, please check the description for a link. I hope you enjoy it. In a quiet room, if you press your ear against a pillow, you can hear your heartbeat. As a kid, the muffled, rhythmic beat sounded like soft footsteps on a carpeted floor. So as a kid, almost every night, just as I was about to drift off to sleep, I would hear these footsteps and I would be ripped back to consciousness, terrified. For my entire childhood, I lived with my mother in a fairly nice neighborhood that was in a transitional phase. People of lower economic means were gradually moving in, and my mother and I were two of those people. We lived in the kind of house you see being transported in two pieces on the interstate, but my mom took good care of it. There were a lot of woods surrounding the neighborhood that I would play in and explore during the day, but at night, as things often do to a kid, they took on a more sinister feeling. This, coupled with the fact that, due to the nature of our house, there was a fairly large crawl space underneath, filled my mind with imaginary monsters and inescapable scenarios which would consume my thoughts when I was awoken by the footsteps. I told my mom about the footsteps and she said that I was just imagining things. I persisted enough that she blasted my ears with water from a turkey baster once just to placate me, since I thought that would help. Of course, it didn't. Despite all the creepiness and footsteps, the only weird thing that ever happened was that, every now and then, I would wake up on the bottom bunk despite having gone to sleep on the top. But this wasn't really weird, since I'd sometimes get up to pee or get something to drink, and could only just remember going back to sleep on the bottom bunk. I'm an only child, so it didn't matter. This would happen once or twice a week, but waking up on the bottom bunk wasn't too terrifying. But one night, I didn't wake up on the bottom bunk. I had heard the footsteps, but was too far gone to be woken up by them. And when I was awoken, it wasn't from the sound of footsteps or a nightmare, but because I was cold. Really cold. When I opened my eyes, I saw stars. I was in the woods. I sat up immediately and tried to figure out what was going on. I thought that I was dreaming, but that didn't seem right, though neither did me being in the woods. There was a deflated pool float right in front of me, one of those ones shaped like a shark. This only added to the surreal feeling, but after a while it seemed like I just wasn't going to wake up because I wasn't asleep. I stood up to orient myself, but I didn't recognize these woods. I played in the woods by my house all the time, so I knew them really well, but if these weren't the same woods, then how could I get out? I took a step and felt a shooting pain in my foot, which knocked me back to where I had just been laying. I had stepped on a thorn. By the light of the moon, I could see that they were everywhere. I looked at my other foot, but it was fine, and as a matter of fact, so was the rest of me. I didn't have another scratch on me, and I wasn't even that dirty. I cried for a little bit, and then stood back up. I didn't know which way to go, so I just picked a direction. I resisted the urge to call out, since I wasn't sure I wanted to be found by who or what might be out there. I walked for what seemed like hours. I tried to walk in a straight line, and to course correct when I had to take detours, but I was a kid and I was afraid. There weren't any howls or screams, and only once did I hear any noise that scared me. It sounded like a crying baby. I think now it was just a cat, but I panicked. I ran, veering in different directions to avoid big thicks of bushes and collapsed trees. I was paying close attention to where I stepped, because by that point my feet were in pretty bad shape. I paid too much attention to where I was stepping and not enough to where those steps were leading, because not long after hearing the cry I saw something that filled me with a kind of despair I haven't experienced since. It was the pool float. I was only ten feet from where I had woken up. This wasn't magic or some supernatural space bending. I was lost. Up until that moment I thought more about getting out of the woods than how I got in, but being back at the beginning caused my mind to swim. I wasn't even sure that these were my woods. I'd only been hoping that they were. Had I run in a huge circle around to that spot? Or did I just get turned around and start making my way back? How was I going to get out? At the time I thought the North Star was just the brightest star, and so I looked and found the brightest star and followed it. Eventually things started to look more familiar, and when I saw the ditch, a dirt ditch my friends and I would have dirt clawed wars in, I knew I had made it out. By that point I was walking really slowly because my feet hurt so much, but I was so happy to be close to home that I broke into a light jog. When I actually saw the roof of my house over a neighboring lower set house, I let out a light sob and ran faster. I just wanted to be home. I had already decided that I wouldn't say anything because I had no idea what I could possibly say. I would get back to the house somehow, clean up, and get into bed. My heart sunk as I rounded the corner and my house came fully into view. Every light in the house was on. 
I knew my mom was up, and I knew I would have to explain or try to explain where I had been, and I couldn't even figure out where to start. My run became a jog, which became a walk. I saw her silhouette through the blinds, and although I was worried about how to explain things to her, that didn't matter to me at that point. I walked up the couple of steps on the porch and put my hand on the doorknob and turned. Right before I pushed it open, two arms wrapped around me and pulled me back. I screamed as loud as I could, Mom, help me, please, Mom! The feeling of being so close to being safe and then being physically pulled away from it filled me with a kind of dread that is, even after all these years, indescribable. The door I had been torn away from opened and a flash of hope shot through my heart, but it wasn't my mom. It was a man and he was enormous. I thrashed around and kicked at the shins of the person holding me while also trying to get away from the person who had just come out of my house. I was scared. But I was furious. Let me go! Where is she? Where's my mom? What did you do to her? As my throat stung from screaming and I was drawing in another breath, I became aware of a sound that had been present for longer than I had perceived it. Honey, please calm down. I've got you. It sounded like my mom. The arms loosened and set me down, and as a man approaching me blocked out the porch light with his head, I noticed his clothes. He was a cop. I turned to face the voice behind me and saw that it really was my mom. Everything was okay. I began to cry and the three of us went inside. I'm so glad you're home, sweetie. I was worried I'd never see you again. By that point, she was crying too. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. I just wanted to come home. I'm sorry. It's okay, just don't ever do that again. I'm not sure me or my shins could take it. A little laughter broke through my sobs and I smiled a bit. I'm sorry for kicking you, but why'd you have to grab me like that? I was just afraid you'd run away again. I was confused. What do you mean? We found the note on your pillow, she said and pointed at the piece of paper that the police officer was sliding across the table. I picked up the note and read it. It was a running away letter. It said that I was unhappy and never wanted to see her or any of my friends again. The police officer exchanged a few words with my mom on the porch while I stared at the letter. I didn't remember writing a letter. I didn't remember anything about any of this. But even if I sometimes went to the bathroom at night and didn't remember, or even if I could have gone to the woods on my own, even if all that was true, the one thing I knew at that point was, this isn't how you spell my name. I didn't write this letter. Part 2. Balloons When I was five years old, I went to an elementary school that, from what I've come to understand, was really adamant about the importance of learning through activity. It was part of a new program designed to allow children to rise at their own pace, and to facilitate this, the school encouraged teachers to come up with really inventive lesson plans. Each teacher was given the latitude to create his or her own themes, which would run for the duration of the grade, and all the lessons in math, reading, etc. would be designed in the spirit of the theme. These themes were called groups. There was a space group, a sea group, an earth group, and the group I was in, community. In kindergarten in this country, you don't learn much except how to tie your shoes and how to share, so most of it isn't very memorable. I only remember two things very clearly. First, that I was the best at writing my name the right way, and second, the balloon project, which was really the hallmark of the community group, since it was a pretty clever way to show how a community functioned at a really basic level. You've probably heard of this activity. On one Friday, towards the beginning of the year, we walked into the classroom in the morning and saw that there was a fully inflated balloon tied off with a string taped to the, each of our desks. Sitting on each of our desks was a marker, a pen, a piece of paper, and an envelope. The project was to write a note on the paper, put it in the envelope, and attach it to the balloon, which we could draw a picture on if we wanted. Most of the kids started fighting over the balloons because they wanted different colors, but I started on my note, which I had thought a lot about. All the notes had to follow a loose structure, but we were allowed to be creative within those boundaries. My note was something like this. Hi, you found my balloon. My name is, my name, and I attend blank elementary school. You can keep the balloon, but I hope you write me back. I like Mighty Max, exploring, building forts, swimming, and friends. What do you like? Write me back soon. Here's a dollar for the mail. On the dollar I wrote, for stamps, right across the front, which my mom said was unnecessary, but I thought it was genius, so I did it. The teacher took a Polaroid of each of us with our balloons and had us put them in the envelope along with our letter. They also included another letter that I assume explained the nature of the project and sincere appreciation for anyone's participation in writing back and sending photos of their city or neighborhood. That was the whole idea, to build a sense of community without having to leave the school and to establish safe contact with other people. It seemed like such a fun idea. Over the next couple of weeks, the letters started to roll in. 
Most came with pictures of different landmarks, and each time a letter would come in, the teacher would pin the picture on a big wall map we had put up showing where the letter had come from and how far the balloon had traveled. It was a really smart idea because we actually looked forward to coming to school to see if we had gotten our letter. For the duration of the year, we had one day a week where we could write back to our pen pal, or another student's pen pal in case our letter hadn't come in yet. Mine was one of the last to arrive. When I came into the classroom, I looked at my desk, and once again I didn't see any letter waiting for me, but as I sat down, the teacher approached me and handed me an envelope. I must have looked so excited, because as I was, I was about to open it, she put her hand on mine to stop me and said, Please don't be upset. I didn't understand what she meant. Why would I be upset now that my letter had come? Initially, I was mystified that she would even know what was in the envelope, but now I realized that, of course, the teachers had screened the contents to make sure there was nothing obscene. But all the same, how could I be disappointed? When I opened the envelope, I understood. There was no letter. The only thing in the envelope was a Polaroid, but I couldn't make out what it was. It looked like a patch of desert, but it was too blurry to decipher. It appeared as if the camera had moved while the picture was being taken. There was no return address, so I couldn't even write back if I wanted to. I was crushed. The school year pressed on, and the letters had stopped coming for nearly all of the other students. After all, you can only continue a written correspondence with a kindergartner for so long. Everyone, including myself, had lost interest in the letters almost completely. Then I got another envelope. My excitement was rejuvenated, and I reveled in the fact that I was still getting a letter when most of the other pen pals had abandoned their involvement. It made sense that I had received another delivery. There had been nothing but a blurry picture in the first one, so this was probably to make up for that. But again, there was no letter at all, just another picture. This one was more distinguishable, but I still didn't understand it. The photograph was angled way up, catching the top corner of a building, and the rest of the image was distorted by a lens flare from the sun. Because the balloons didn't travel very far, and because they were all launched on the same day, the board became a bit cluttered, so the policy for students still exchanging letters became that they could take the photographs home. My best friend Josh had the second highest number of pictures taken home at the end of the year. His pen pal was really cooperative and sent him pictures from all around the neighboring city. Josh took home, I think, four pictures. I took home nearly 50. The envelopes were all opened by the teacher, but after a while I stopped even looking at the pictures. However, I saved them in one of my drawers that housed my collection of rocks, baseball cards, comic book cards, and little miniature baseball batting helmets that I get out of the vending machine at the Winn-Dixie after t-ball games. With the school year over, my attention turned to other things. My mom had gotten me a small snow cone machine for Christmas that year, and Josh had really coveted it, so much that his parents bought him a slightly nicer one for his birthday, which was towards the end of the school year. That summer, we had the idea that we could set up a snow cone stand to make money. We thought we'd make a fortune selling snow cones at one dollar. Josh lived in a different neighborhood, but we eventually decided that my neighborhood would be better because there were a lot of people who cared for their lawns. The yards in my neighborhood were slightly bigger. We did this for five weekends in a row until my mom told us we had to stop, and I've only recently come to understand why she did that. On the fifth weekend, Josh and I were counting our money. Because we both had a machine, we each had a separate stack of money that we put together in one stack and then split evenly. We had made a total of $16 that day, and as, after, as Josh paid out my fifth dollar, feeling, a feeling of profound surprise consumed me. The dollar said, for stamps. Josh noticed my shock and asked if he'd miscounted. I told him about the dollar and he said, that's so cool, man. As I thought about it, I came to agree. The idea that the dollar had made it right back to me after changing so many hands floored me. I rushed inside to tell my mom, but my excitement coupled with her being distracted by a phone call made my story incomprehensible, and she responded simply by saying, Oh wow, that's neat! Frustrated, I went back outside and told Josh I had something to show him. Back in my room, I opened the drawer and took out a stack of envelopes and showed him some of the pictures. I started with the first picture and went through about ten before Josh lost interest and asked if I wanted to go play in the ditch before his mom came to pick him up, so that's what we did. We had a dirt war for a while, but that was interrupted several times by the rustling in the woods around us. There were raccoons and stray cats that lived in there, but this was making a little too much noise and we traded guesses at what it was in an attempt to scare each other. My last guess was that it was a mummy, but in the end Josh kept insisting that it was a robot because of the sounds we heard. Before we left, he got a little serious and looked me right in the eyes and said, You heard it too, right? Sounded like a robot. You heard it too, right? I had heard it, and since it sounded mechanical, I agreed that it was probably a robot. It's only now that I understood what we heard. When we got back, Josh's mom was waiting for him at the kitchen table with my mom. Josh told his mom about the robot. They laughed and Josh went home. My mom and I ate dinner and then I went to bed. 
I didn't stay in bed for long before I crept out and decided that, due to the day's events, I would revisit the envelopes, now since the whole affair seemed more interesting. I took the first envelope and set it on the floor, and set the blurry desert Polaroid on top. I laid the second envelope right next to it, and placed the oddly angled Polaroid of a building's top corner on top, and did this with each picture until they formed a grid that was about 5 by 10. I was always taught to be careful with things that I was collecting, even if I wasn't really sure that they were valuable. I noticed that the pictures gradually became more decipherable. There was a tree with a bird on it, a speed limit sign, a power line, a group of people walking into some building, and then I saw something that vexed me so powerfully that I can now, as I write this, distinctly remember feeling dizzy, incapable of only a single repeating thought. Why am I in this picture? In this photograph of the group of people entering the building, I saw myself holding hands with my mother in the very back of the crowd of people. We were at the very edge of the photo, but it was undeniably us. And as my eyes swam over the sea of Polaroids, I became increasingly anxious. It was a really odd feeling. It wasn't fear, it was the feeling that you get when you're in trouble. I'm not sure why I was flooded with that feeling, but there I sat, floundering with the distinct sense that I had done something wrong. And this feeling only intensified as I looked on at the rest of the photos after the one that had so powerfully struck me. I was in every photo. None of them were close shots, none of them were only of me, but I was in every single one of them. Off to the side, in the back, the bottom of the frame. Some of them only had the tiniest part of my face captured at the very edge of the photo, but nevertheless I was there. I was always there. I didn't know what to do. Your mind works in funny ways as a kid, but there was a large part of me that was afraid of getting in trouble simply for still being up. Since I already had the looming feeling of having done something wrong, I decided that I would wait until tomorrow. The next day, my mom was off work and spent most of the morning cleaning up around the house. I watched cartoons, I imagined, and waited until I thought it was a good time to show her the Polaroids. When she went out to get the mail, I grabbed a couple of the pictures and put them on the table in front of me as I sat waiting for her to come back in. When she returned, she was already opening the mail and threw some junk mail into the trash can, and I said, Mom, can you come here for a second? I have these pictures. Just give me a minute, honey. I need to mark these on my calendar. After a minute or two, she came and stood behind me and asked what I needed. I could hear her shuffling with the mail behind me, and I, but I just looked at the Polaroids and I told her about them. As I explained more and pointed to the pictures, her frequent uh-huh and okays decreased, and she was suddenly completely quiet and only making a little noise with the mail. The next noise I heard from her sounded as if she was trying to catch her breath in a room that had no air left in it. At last, her struggling gasps were conquered, and she simply dropped the remaining mail on the table and ran to the kitchen to get the phone. Mom, I'm sorry, I didn't know about these. Please don't be mad at me. With the phone pressed against her ear, she was walking, running back and forth, and shouting into it. I nervously fiddled with the mail next to my Polaroids. The top envelope had something sticking out that I thoughtlessly and anxiously pulled on until it came out. It was another Polaroid. Confused, I thought that somehow one of my Polaroids slipped onto the stack when she threw the mail down, but when I turned it over and I looked at it, I realized I had not seen this one before. To my dismay, it was me, but this one was a much closer shot. I was surrounded by trees and was smiling, but it wasn't just me, I noticed. Josh was there too. This was us from yesterday. I started yelling for my mom, who was still screaming into the phone. I repeatedly yelled for her until she finally responded with what? And I could only think to ask, who are you calling? I'm talking with the police, honey. But why? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do anything. She answered me with a response that I never understood until I was forced to revisit these events from the earliest years of my life. She grabbed the envelope off the table, and the picture of Josh and I spun and slid, landing next to the other Polaroids in front of me. She held the envelope up to my eyes, but I could only look at her and watch as the color began draining out of her face. With tears welling up, she said that she had to call the police because there was no postmark. Whoever had sent them, delivered them personally. I hope you guys enjoyed this reading and illustration of Pen Pal. I really enjoyed this one. I like how weird and creepy it is. It gives you that uneasy feeling without really giving you any answers. If you enjoyed it too, let me know. And if you have a creepypasta you'd like me to read, feel free to suggest it. This one was suggested multiple times by different people, which is one of the reasons I ended up doing it. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. Stay safe out there, guys. Thank you to all of my patrons, including Catherine VG, Gaia Muscayo, Scott Peterson, Weeb, Ellie Quiznak, Miss Misu, BB Dave, Kato Cat, Christy Stewart, Painamel, 
Elizabeth Alvin, Kalpumpon, Loaf, De Sweet Twelve, Aaron Sawicki, Super Pixel, Taka, Isabella Spooky, Lovely, Lachlan MD, Mystic, Enzo Jobert, Ya Boy ST, JJ Jade, Lawyer Buter, Pastel Gmin, Le Bleble, and Addy Visual. Thank you guys so much for your support.